Um, before we start, just a few housekeeping things. I think most of you probably have got your cameras off, uh, but make sure you're muted throughout the event so we don't have any background noise. Um, the event will be recorded, so again, if you don't want to be appear, then turn your cameras off. Um, please use the chat to send your questions to the speaker throughout the event. Um, we can pass questions on to the speaker afterwards. Um, so when you enter your question in the chat, please put your name and then your question so we know who's, who's asking what. Um, so today we're going to be hearing from Denise Smith from the Lace Guild um, about Anne Collier's dolls. So without further ado, I will hand over to Denise to tell you a bit more about the dolls. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Denise Smith. I can't see any of you because we're, we're still Zoom novices. So um, bear with me. Um, I do a bit, about, about, a bit about myself, how I got involved in the Lace Guild and Lace, a bit about the Lace Guild, a little bit about Lace history, talk about Anne Collier and her dolls, which are amazing, and um, her amazing work and contribution to, to Lace, and um, a little bit about the fashion, because that was her emphasis of doing these dolls. The, the lace fashion um, and I'll talk a little bit about Gwyneth who is our curator of the museum and she what she doesn't know about lace and fashion isn't worth knowing so um, I'll begin my name's Denise Smith I'm a member of the Lace Guild and I have been making lace for 27 years I started um, lace classes and then gradually got involved with the guild because it's quite local to me. The lace guild has got a headquarters called the Hollies in Starbridge. We are on the main road in between the red house cone and the glass house. We're actually in the glass quarter and we enjoy quite a lot of collaboration with the glass museums. Um, we, the lace guild is a membership organisation and we have um, a quarterly magazine. And, but also in our premises, we've got an archive, which is extensive. We have an exhibition room, which we're in now, which is empty of an exhibition at the moment because of COVID we've been closed down. And we have a library and we have offices upstairs. So we are quite, quite a nice little building to visit. We do do exhibitions every three months, we change the exhibitions. Um, the Lace Guild itself has been going since 19, this is where I've got to refer to my notes, sorry. Uh, 1976, the Lace Guild was formed. There was a group of Lace teachers who uh, decided to get together in Bedfordshire and they um, had what they called lacings. And these lacings became very popular and quite larger and larger. And uh, a TV crew appeared at the last one. And the lady, there was a group of ladies, Doreen Wright, Anne Collier, Pat Berry, and Anne Woodward, discussed the possibility of starting up a lace guild. And they met at Doreen's house, in January 1976, wrote, the, uh, wrote and formed the Constitution and the Lace Guild was born. And it's been going ever since. Um, we try as an organisation to further the cause of lace. We try to help people with instruction. We try to keep up the standard. We try to keep lace modern and innovative, as well as keeping up the traditional standards. We try to put people in touch where they can go for lace groups and lace teachers. Um, we do exhibitions, events. I myself go to the NEC, to the um, Birmingham NEC, every year when it, when, when it was going. Um, we do, I do quite a lot. I think my, life, my, life, my whole life has been taken over by lace and my partners too. Um, so about lace in general lace people think of lace as nice little fine white stuff but there's several different types of lace and again the lace guild likes to encourage all of them there's tatting crochet macrame 
Tenerife lace, um, needle lace. There's lots and lots of different types of bobbin lace. All different types of lace are all lace. Lace is the definition of lace is a fabric with holes in, a decorative fabric. So skirting on to a little bit about lace history. History, um, Egypt, the lace has been found, types of embroidered and decorative fabrics deemed as lace have been found as far back as the Egyptian tombs. So lace has been around as, as long as man has been around because they like to decorate their costumes, they like to decorate themselves. And so lace has evolved over, over the years and it has been around for a long time. It, we think it started mainly in Venice, in, in Venetian lace, and it was mainly needle lace, uh, but it evolved and spread across Europe as the, the, the lace makers and the glass makers and the silk makers tended to be of a type of person. I think they were Huguenots. I've, I've tried to uh, find out specifically what race they belong to or what community they belong to but they were they were persecuted and so they moved from that area and they moved across Europe and a lot of them settled in France, um, Belgium and England and they took their lace with them and so lace came to England um, that was about the 1500s uh, lace came into its own in the Elizabethan times. In Elizabethan era, lace was really at its height of handmade, obviously handmade lace. There was no machines, and the predominant, the, well, the, the predominant fibre was flax, which was linen. The cotton wasn't invented till the 1800s, um, so it was linen thread which could be spun extremely finely. Uh, we've got some of the uh, Elizabethan lace that has survived because linen will survive. And it's finer than anything that we can produce now. It, the, the, the fineness of the thread was just unbelievable. And they didn't have the electric lights we had. So I really, we marvel at how they produce these pieces of lace, which we can see in the V&A Museum. I think we've got some very old pieces in our museum. Um, so lace has been going for a long time and it's evolved as time's gone on. Lace was very, very expensive. Obviously it was handmade. Only the wealthy wore it. And it was, it was a note of wealth. It was used for, you know, they decorated themselves. It was a form of jewellery. And it was left in wills. It was so, so important. It was smuggled. Shakespeare himself left lace in his will. It was, it's, it was so important and so expensive and so valued. And lace eventually, it, it took different forms. And then eventually we had the First World War and the event of lace machines. And the lace making machines um, people think of Nottingham Lace. It's Nottingham Lace was the centre of the machine-made lace. And machine-made lace all, almost knocked handmade lace out of, out of existence because it was so cheap. And sort of towards the end of the Victorian era, people were having whole dresses made of lace, huge great shawls, because machine-made lace was, was cheaper and you could have rather large quantities of it. So lace has evolved. Now lace is, uh, today is hobby status. It's um, more of a craft and more of an art form. Um, most lace makers that started the Lace Guild, they've been developing it and pushing it and lots and lots of other people in the lace world. It's more of an art form, more of a craft form. We, um, we take delight in sort of pushing the boundaries and using a lot of colour. And um, this, is, this is one example. This is Anne Collier's Firebird Fan. And this is beautiful. This is a mixture of needle lace and bobbin lace. But I just think that 
is incredible. I, I've, I've fallen in love with that. And that's in the Lace Museum. We have a museum of over 19,000 pieces of lace. And the predominance of the museum is to preserve technique and types of lace. So they're very careful what they, they select, what they keep. We have a museum committee and we have museum volunteers. And every other um, exhibition in the exhibition room in the Hollies, which is open to the public, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and one Saturday a month, the exhibition is open to the public. And you can come in and see our exhibitions of lace. And the every other week, every other exhibition is museum lace. The following one will be modern lace, lace that's been made by members or any other organisation that we can get into contact with that would like to demonstrate, like to exhibit their lace. So uh, we always do an exhibition for the glass uh, event, the Biennale, which is going to be next year. So the uh, Hollies will be open for the whole of that, the, the glass Biennale. We also run a competition. Every three years we invite members and non-members, any lace makers can enter a piece of lace into our competition. And at the end of that three years, we have an exhibition. And this year we're going to have the exhibition at the Glass House. So there should be anywhere 85 to 100 pieces of lace that have been entered into this competition will be exhibited for so um, there's lots going on. There's always lots going on. Oh yes, we've also got, um, it's all right, I've got my cameraman who's whispered to me to prompt me, that we've got a Facebook page, the Lace Guild have got a Facebook page, but we've also got a Lockdown Lace face, Facebook page, which is where people have started to talk to each other uh, and put pictures of the lace that they've made during lockdown and some of the lace is amazing and we're just hoping that people will take those and enter them into the competition because it follows the rules it's been made within the last couple of years so they could enter those pieces so if you want to look if you're a facebooker you can look look up the lace guild and lockdown lace and we also have a tweet site i don't know much about tweet but we have a twitter account yes twitter account so um we, we're trying to get with it we're trying to get modern a lot of our members are quite old quite elderly and uh, but we are we are getting there so i've rambled on about the lace guild and what we do um i've said about a bit about the history of lace now we need to talk about Anne collier Anne Collier was actually the, she was the chair of the Lace Guild in 1982. She's also been the president of OIDFA, which is a, an international lace organisation, which I'm a member of. And uh, I've been to an OIDFA conference in Zandam in Holland, which is fantastic. So the conferences are massive for OIDFA. And uh, we were going to Estonia this year but Covid has called a halt to that so now it's going to be an online conference which I'm quite looking forward to. As a result of the Covid I've taken early retirement so I can do even more for the lay skill now. So um, that's the Covid has had a fantastic effect on everybody I should imagine. Um, Anne Collier is quite elderly now I think she's I think she's in her 90s but she's still making lace and she's, I don't think she's not teaching anymore, but when she was teaching, she taught in the UK, she taught in France, she taught in Finland, in Austria and Spain. She was a very, very active person. She's written seven books, which I've got here. She's made, I can't, I do not, I can't tell you how many fans she's made. But the dolls, we have 17 of her dolls in our collection. And there are many more out there. 
So let's start having a look at the lace and the dolls. We have, can you sit? I hope you can see, we have a group of dolls here. And <clears throat> most of them appear on the slides. So I'm going to try and put the slideshow on there. No, again, bear with me as we have battled to get this slideshow together. So we'll try sharing. What's it say? Only the host can share this meeting. Oh dear. Share contents. Can you can you share? Can you put me on share, please, Heidi? Heidi, are you there? Yes, sorry, I'm not one of the hosts. I need to get Laura to do it. Hang on, I'll get Laura to do it. <clears throat> Bear with us a minute while we, we wrestle with the technicalities of Zoom. I think, no, I need more dogs. We are actually in our exhibition room, which is bare at the moment. It's uh, just all glass cases, but I've put Anne Collier's storyboards and that's the old fashioned way of doing things before the days of all this um, internet stuff and uh, the computer. So if you can pan round and show some of the storyboards. We put them in the cases and they're the old fashioned storyboards and they're beautiful. We, we've got to do some work, remedial work on them to try and preserve them because they're falling apart a bit, but these actually sit in our archives. And I don't know, I can't, I didn't find out, I should have found out when she actually started this project. But um, her storyboards are absolutely beautiful. So those are in our archive. So can I do it now? No? I still can't share my slideshow. Oh dear. So we we'll always start talking about the dolls using the um, storyboards, if I can. I'll have to improvise. Right, her storyboard about the crinoline. I hope everybody can see how people used to have to wear these awful frames and the dress and the bustles. And they used to have to wear these contraptions underneath their clothes to get the effect of the dresses. And this, uh, this beautiful doll is a crinoline doll. She's absolutely beautiful. I hope people can see her. And she has a lace shawl and she has a lace, they're called lapettes. They had beautiful decoration that hung down the side of their heads. Beautiful lace collars and cuffs. She's got a beautiful lace fan and lace all decorating around the edge of her clothes. Now, Hi Denise, Denise, you have now been made a co-host so you should be able to share your slides okay. now. So this is our, this is the crinoline doll. She's beautiful. And that's, um, Victorian, the crinoline. Oh, let's see. Now, Google Drive. Oh dear. Bear with as it's, it's loading. These things take time. Oh dear, oh dear. Sorry about this, everybody. And Collier's dolls, here we are. Share screen. Open. Zoom. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, there it is. 
It's not sharing. Yes, it is. Oh, lovely. Here we are. There's the, the storyboard about the Elizabethan doll. I'll show you the Elizabethan doll at the end. Um, she's on the, she's on the board, on the uh, plinth. You might you may have spotted her. But the Elizabethans again, as I said, beginning part of the uh, pr proliferation of making lace. The Elizabethans were absolutely uh, the wealthy people had lots and lots of lace made for them. And there were hundreds and hundreds of women making themselves go blind and working for pittance, making these beautiful clothes. A lot of the pattern, a lot of the Victoria, uh, the Elizabethan clothing had beautiful black work. It's a form of embroidery. And uh, a lot of costumes were lace and black work and lots of embroidery. The threads were linen and the ruffs, the very, very wealthy people had ruffs. They were made of a type of muslin and they had layers and layers of material and they had lace edges to them. So there's miles and miles of lace, but the very wealthy people had a lace top to it. They had an actual lace ruff on the top of it all. Lace collars, lace cuffs, lace trims around the clothes. The men all wore lace cuffs. Um, they, I've just noticed a question. Somebody said, why did they put gauze over it? Because this embroidery was so precious, they put gauze to protect the embroidery so that it wouldn't catch, that people wouldn't catch the threads because these clothes were worn, they were never washed, and they were worn. Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth I had hundreds of gowns, and they were all kept, and she wore them all in rotation, and they were never washed. So these, this fine embroidery had to be protected from being caught by jewellery and by people. So they put gauze over their fine embroidery, because it's beautiful. When we, the slideshow ends, I can show you some of the black work on one of the costumes. It's beautiful. So the next slide is... Oh dear. Excuse me. I can't do it. Yes, the, there we are. That's the pattern. That Anne Collier wrote a book about how to make some of these designs. And there's her pattern for you to copy. And up at the top, you can see the um, designs. It's a, akin to a cross stitch. You use, you use a grid and it's, it's called black work. So there's the doll and you'll see her in her split. You can see her in her actuality. And there's the, the collar in the book. You can see the collar and you'll see the collar on the, on the doll. The dolls. I'm afraid look a little bit battered because they are being packed away in boxes and I'm not museum trained so I am not going to try and straighten them out or do anything to them. They are precious museum items and it would be worth the more, more than my life's work to, to ruin them. So then we have the next level that from the Elizabethans we go on to the Stuarts. And again, we see this beautiful blackwork jacket, which when I finish the slides, I'll show you the little, the miniature one that we've got. And they used an incredible amount of lace in this period. But can you see that the big ruffs, the big ruffs around the necks have gone, but they've still got an incredible amount of, of lace, cuffs, collars. It wasn't all bobbing lace, a lot of it was needle lace. Very intricate work. And the, Poor ladies, it's usually ladies that had to sit and make this. Then we come to the Stuarts, and again, they excelled. The men and the women were absolutely festooned with lace. Oh dear, I haven't got my man doll out. I'm sure I put, put out uh, one of the men dressed in beautiful Stuart costume, but 
I seem to have forgotten him. Sorry about that. But you'll see the other dolls. So the Stuarts, again, a lot of lace. And this is the time when lace was really being smuggled. And some of the horrible stories, they'd, they'd smuggle lace in because they, they started to tax the lace to try and preserve the English lace makers uh, province. They tried to help the, British, the English lace makers by forbidding French or Belgian lace coming in. And um, they, they, they smuggled lace. It was so valuable that they smuggled it. And there's one story of they starved a dog to, to bear bones in France. Then they strapped lots and lots of lace around it and they used the skin of another dog to strap around the dog. And then the dog was brought in. And so they smuggled the lace using this dog. And I think, I'm hoping that the story at the end was a nice story that they fed the dog back up again and he was okay. But um, they, they definitely lace was smuggled. It was such a valuable commodity. Then we get on to the next period, which is the end of the Stuart period, which is, I've got lost now, it's the Regent. Now this is the end of the Stuart period before, just before the Regency. Again, but the, 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 uh, this here is where it's embroidered to make it look as if it's lace. So somebody hasn't quite had quite enough money to have it completely lace or lace was getting to the point where it was very expensive and that, I think they used to they started to launder their clothes at this point so they were a little bit more particular about um, what they put on because uh, maids uh, had to unpick all the lace off the clothes even the underwear and then they had to wash the lace separately and the clothes separately. And then they had to starch and sort the lace out and then sew it back on again. So it was a very labour intensive um, thing having lace on your clothes, especially if you wanted to wash them. And hundreds, lots of maids were involved in looking after a lady's wardrobe. You see, the gentleman's got lots of lace as well. Now, in the 1690, there was a fashion, and it didn't last very long, where they had these fantastic high um, like mantillas, but they called them fontangs, 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 and they, they were made entirely of lace, but the fashion didn't seem to last very long. It only lasted about 10 years, but it was mainly, again, the French, named after the mistress of Louis the 14th, Louis the 14th, all right, I, I have to work out the Roman numerals. Then we get on to the Georgian period. And again, beautiful elaborate costumes and they had what they call panniers with the Georgian costumes. They wore side things like, like, like side, side saddle panniers under their clothes so that they were sort of not quite so wide as the crinoline which was a later fashion this was a, a start of wearing these contraptions under your clothes so the georgians again i think we've got a georgian doll yes and the beautiful lace again lots and lots of lace and mainly only for the wealthy there were another georgian doll and they wore huge petticoats because it was cold we didn't have so they didn't have central eating then they wore huge petticoats but the fashion was to have the dresses cut so that the front was open to show the underneath as well to show the underskirts as it were but the underskirts were so decorative and beautiful and covered in lace and we've got one one to show you There she is. That's the one I've got that, her on the display. But that's the picture of her in Anne Collier's book with a close up of the lace. Anne takes pains to point out that the lace isn't exact copies of the old lace. They are modern designs. They are designs that she's found in books 
they may well be Georgian patterns, but she's not sure, but she's, she's used poetic license to make the lace in keeping. And she's made all of these costumes and she's made all of the lace. Beautiful. So there we are, we've got the type of costume where the drop front started to come in. So we had all different waistline styles, but that was the drop front that came in in 1770 to 1780. Then we have, this is the male the illustration that the male fashion was just as ornate. They used always lace cuffs and lace cravats and collars. The ladies wore a lot of lace around their necks and around their hats. And a lot of it, so she said there, worked in Bucks Point. Bucks Point is a lace that was that evolved in Buckinghamshire. This is we we, we know that the, one of the groups of Huguenots settled in Buckinghamshire, and they evolved this type of lace, and it stayed pretty true. You know, we've got Buckinghamshire lace, Bucks Point. We've got Bedfordshire lace. We've got um, Honiton, which is in Devon. We've got quite defined lace, which we're trying to keep, pre preserve the techniques going. The, the lace guild tries to preserve the techniques. Now we get to the reg Regency period, which is where the waists go much higher. Not quite so, you know, you haven't got these huge skirts. And this is um, the Regency time is, and I've forgotten, Darcy. Mr. Darcy. So yeah, the Pride and Prejudice. The beautiful Regency costumes that they wore. And so we've got, um, I think we've got a Regency lady. Yes, we've got a Regency costume doll. And again, there was an awful lot of lace on these costumes. But it, you notice now that the prints are starting to come in. They've got some beautiful, elaborate prints and they used gorgeous materials, brocades and silks. I've got a lot of muslin in um, Regency. A lot of ladies were very gentle. This is a beautiful, this is Carrick Macross, this uh, veil over her hat, um, which is a type of embroidery. It's a very complicated embroidery and very, very fine work, but that's Carrick Macross, which is again a form of lace. Then we have beautiful Regency lady, which we again we've got her here on display. And there's a close up picture of her stole and her cuffs and her neck and the decoration around the bottom. And I so said, Anne Collier made all of these dolls, made all of the costumes, and made, and made all of the lace. Next one, come on. This lady, again, Regency lady. I think, um, I think Anne, like me, must have fallen in love with the Regency period because she, she had quite a lot of Regency dolls. But again, you can see there the fine gauze over the top of the dress. You can see the hand embroidery, the embroidered net, which again is another form of lace. And the fan, which is again, embroidered net but beautiful of course the lace machine hasn't come in yet so all this was done by hand um, this is another regency lady and again this is carrick macross beautiful it's um it's it's made by you you put layers of net and different textures and different weights together you embroider around all the shapes and then you finally cut to the stitches with a very fine pair of scissors. And I've never been brave enough to even try it. It's very, very fine, like buttonhole stitch around the edge of these pieces of, of gauze. So this lady here, and she would have had a dress like that made in that fashion. And lace around the bonnets, more so, they decorated the bonnets towards Regency. They, they loved the bonnets in Regency. This lady, she it's getting on towards the end, towards the beginning of Victoriana. But look at the, she had a lace fan, a beautiful lace shawl, lace in her hair, collar, around the edge of a dress. 
And that lace, the lace shawls, when they were handmade, they were very, very rare and very expensive because it took a lot of people. One person wouldn't make that shawl, several people would make it. And there were pieces either joined together using lace techniques or stitched together by, again, another person would be putting it, putting that shawl together. That's the close up of the fan, which is, um, I think it's, yes, it's box point. So that is made. That would take about that tiny little fan, and you'll see how tiny they are. That would have taken upwards of 50 pairs, 50 pairs of, of bobbins to make. That's the, now that's the, the storyboard I was trying to show you, it was about the bustle and the crinoline, the frame that they used to have to wear underneath the dresses. And um, there was one thing that I read, the ladies, there was quite a lot of casualties because the ladies' materials and dresses were very flammable. You'd got open fires and they were swinging around with these huge dresses. And quite a few ladies actually went up in flames, which just sounds really sad, but uh, it was quite common. So the crinoline was quite dangerous. And there's a, another, this is sort of towards the, getting towards the end of the Victorian era where still bustles and crinolines, lots of frames worn, lots of very uncomfortable clothes, lots of lace and parasols and fans seem to be really, from Regency onwards, parasols and fans came into vogue. So there are a lot of lace parasols and fans made. And this is another lady with a beautiful bustle, with beautiful colour. We've got her on display and the parasol. And there's the, the lace collar in, in detail. That's book's point again. Just showing the detail. I love that costume again. But this, um, the fan is needle lace on this lady. And it's a again a different sort of lace, a much more robust lace on this lady. And we've got the the uh, the other lady here, Victorian, with the with the train, all decorated with lace. Oh, this is demonstrating the Victorian, sort of towards the end of the Victorian period. I think Victoria, didn't um, Queen Victoria die in 1901. So it's just a, towards the end of the Victorian era. Huge lace collars, but still lots and lots of lace. But this is the time when the machine started to come in. Well, this is another one. This is a, a late Victorian evening dress. And again, I think it's, it's embroidered net. Yes, it's embroidered net. Again, but that is a, a, that's a, a needle lace. That's a much heavier lace, much more robust lace. But that's again, Victorian. But they, they've been made with a needle and thread rather than with bobbins. And then we get to the flapper era. Now this machine made lace is well in now. So this, this dress would have been made by a machine. Um, there was still handmade lace because the, the wealthy still drew the distinction between common lace and real lace. And uh, they did actually prefer the, uh, so gosh, there's another TV series that I loved that was that uh, demonstrated the uh, dressmaking and lace era. House of Elliot. House of Elliot. See, I've got my prompt here. <laughs> the House of Elliot, uh, the beautiful designs there. But a lot of the stuff was machine lace. I mean, you couldn't possibly make a dress that big. Victoria's was made. Uh, hers, hers was handmade completely. But the Queen Victoria's dress was started something like 30, 30 years before she was married. They started making her dress before she even thought about getting married. And um, 
uh, I'm trying to think of another famous wedding dress. Most, 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 if they were handmade, they, ha they took a long time and they were started even before you even thought about getting married. So I think the flapper is there. Oh no. And then this is a doll that she made. It's a, a lace maker. And uh, she wouldn't be have dressed so finely if she was a real lace maker. And um, back in the day, lace makers were not gentry. The, the gentry did embroidery and point work and they did tapestries and crewel. They, they did common, bobbin, bobbin lace making was quite common. So this is, I think this is her poetic license. She liked to make um, a lace make, but you can see the lace on the bonnet and then on the collar. These are the typical sorts of things that people wore towards the end of the Victorian era. They were wearing, a lot of people were wearing bonnets, lace bonnets, because they could. Machine lace came in. And it's just a couple of pictures of some of the edgings that she's made and incorporated in some of the dolls. And there's a picture of the fan that you've seen. So I think that is the end of my slideshow. Um, it's very off-putting because you can't see it. I can't see anybody's faces. But, uh, just another quick flash of Anne Collier, Anne Collier's fan, which I, oh, I just, it's just heavenly. So this lady has made a whole book of fans. She's made hundreds of fans. And uh, so now let's have a quick look at the dolls. And then we got, I've got my timekeeper here. Right. So I need to show you in the pan round. I don't know whether you can see them, where to bring them up closer. But she is beautiful. The lace is just incredible. All made by Anne, Anne Collier. Even this, this piece is handmade. Beautiful. And the train is gorgeous. This lady, this is the, um, the Elizabethan lady. Now, excuse her collar. A collar would be starched and beautifully out as a ruff, but I, I'm frightened to touch it. And her, can you see her sleeves, the black work with the gauze over the top? And embroidery, the embroidery down the front is just incredible. But this is what they would have worn. And I said, they never washed them. And this is the black work jacket. Absolutely beautiful. But people, that was the fashion for the uh, Elizabethan and Edwardian um, Stuart, the early Stuart. Beautiful black work all done embroidered on fine linen and lots of people and as you can imagine you wouldn't want to catch any of these threads you wouldn't want to ruin the embroidery so they did tend to put gauze over a lot of things we have here's the lady with the I mean, if you ever wanted to come and see these dolls, you could make an appointment to come into the museum and the museum cur curator, you could book an appointment and they would show you these dolls. And um, Gwyneth would tell you all about them, about the fashion history. Here's our beautiful Regency lady. You see the lace? I absolutely adore this lady. She, again, she's got the cap, the lappets. The more wealth, wealthy you were, the longer your lappets. You had beautiful sleeves and decoration, the gorgeous silks and the brocades. Here's our crinoline lady from Victoriana. Oh dear. 
her legs are funny. So again, but a lot of lace, a lappet, beautiful collar, a fan, a sleeves, decoration. And she wore, I don't know whether she's, oh yes, she's even got the frame underneath. They wore these underskirts with huge frames underneath them to keep them, keep them uh, out, as it were. And this is another Regency lady. It was easier to bring the, bring the dolls to the camera. You see the stole, beautiful work, and the cap. Beautiful lace, all made by Anne. Uh, so we've got 17 of these in the collection upstairs and they're all wrapped beautifully preserved. And this again, this is the fashion where they split the one, the other Regency lady and this one where they split the top dress. And you can understand why they had to have maids to dress them because I don't know whether she has done it on all of the dolls, but they have so many layers of, can you see the undergarments? Beautiful. And those have got lace on as well and embroidery. And can you see the, sho the shoes are gorgeous on this doll. I can't, don't think you can see the shoes. Can you see, oh yes, we can see the shoes. But she, they're beautiful. But they wore so many layers of clothes and you think we haven't got central eating then. And it didn't matter how many layers you wore, but they'd wear an undergarment, then an underskirt, an under skirt. Then they'd wear the whatever stiffen the clothes. Then they wear the top dress, the underdress, which they could wear in the daytime. And then they'd wear a top dress over the top. And they'd, they'd ladies, ladies of, of wealth and class would change up to five times a day. They'd have five outfits and the flapper. This was when the era of machine made lace and embroidery came to its, came to its fore. As I said, the wealthy still preferred to have some handmade lace because it was it was the thing to have handmade lace. And I think I can now open to questions. Thank you, Denise. That's been really, really interesting. Um, we do have um, some questions. Um, one from Wendy. Um, are the dolls ceramic heads? Do they have ceramic heads, the dolls? They're all ceramic heads. They're beautiful. Porcelain, porcelain heads and hands. And I say one, one fell off the tape, fell off the plinth earlier because the floor in here is an old Edwardian cottage, and the floor's wobbly, and she fell off. And I thought, oh my god, on for the high jump, but she didn't break. Yes, yeah. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, a question from Helen. I think you did cover this um, just. Um, why did the Elizabethans put gauze over their lace? Because it was to, to protect the embroidery. Yeah. And as well as that, if you look on the arm, if you look on the arm of this doll, and on one of the diagrams, which you can't see very well, she's actually got lace on the gauze as well. So it's just um, extra extra extravagance if you like but uh, the gauze was a way of I think protecting well I know it was, it was to, to protect the embroidery because you use your arms a lot more with a jacket you take the jacket off but with it with your arms you, if you cut caught any of that embroidery you'd ruin it so and again I think it was just again another affluent you know you could afford to have lots and lots of decoration and embellishments on your costumes. It's definitely a display of wealth. Um, Helen, Helen also asks, is there a book on the dolls available? Yeah. Yes, we've got um, in the library, 
in our nice library, which I'm, I'm sorry you can't borrow books from the library um, unless you remember, but these are actually available now. You can buy them. And these are two books by Anne Collier. If you Google Lacey Miniature by Anne Collier, um, they're available. So I bought these recently. I borrowed them from the library and I fell in love with the books. So I bought them. And they're only to look at because I'm not going to make the lace. They are, but they're full of patterns and pictures of the dolls. And it gives you all the instructions how to make all the various, gives you all the patterns to make the lace. So yes, they are available still. And they're available second hand book. If you go on the internet and Google it, there's the internet sellers. I think I've got these for, I think eight, eight or nine pounds, whereas they're 15 pounds to buy new or even more than that now. Some of the lace suppliers, if you type in, in, um, in again, in, in Google or whatever search engine you use, you type in lace, bobbin lace suppliers, you'll come up with there's lots of lace suppliers out there. And most people are selling online now, especially now. But they started to before, you know, with the advent of the computer and they sell online. Because, you know, if, if, you're, if they're down in London, I can soon post thread and bits and pieces to you. Yeah, so if, you, if you're interested, you could type in lace supplier. Um, Alan, um, if you want to come in with your question. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I don't know anything about lace, but I found the talk very interesting. Um, there was no mention of Nottingham lace. Um, I'm briefly <laughs> passed over it. Because Nottingham lace is a naughty word in the handmade lace world. Ooh. Nottingham lace was where the machine made lace industry began. Nottingham lace was famous and is still, well, it's a sad, sad thing. Um, the machine, I, I went to the museum uh, how many years ago? 20 years ago? 20 years. It's now shut. The Nottingham lace industry has fallen apart. All the machines have been sold off and gone to China or India. Um, there is no, there's one company making machine made lace in Nottingham now, just one. And uh, out of the whole of Nottingham was just nothing but thousands of machines all clacking away. Yes. Uh, again, if you want to see machine made lace being made, just type in in, in um, YouTube and you'll see from old machines to the machines they use in China, which are the size of this building. They are absolutely ginormous. But um, yes, Nottingham Lace was the center and the heart of the machine made lace industry. And Nottingham Museum, Nottingham Trent Museum, thank goodness have woken up and they're starting to investigate and record. And v the v &A Museum, the Lace Guild at the moment, is a group of us involved in helping a lady who in the v &A Museum in London has got 50 uh, traders books, like, um, what do you call them? Sample, <laughs> Sample books Sample. that they would take, take around to take orders. And she has been, she's, they've got 50 of these and she's trying to, we're trying to identify the lace for her by pictures at the moment. But hopefully when COVID disappears, we will be invited down to the v &A Museum. So I'm quite excited about that. There's a small group of us, of um, Lace Guild members. There's about six of us that are studying with a lady who has made it her work to study machine made lace called Angela Thompson and she's in her 90s and she's anxious to pass on her knowledge and so we're going to classic we were until Covid we were going to her house in oh Abberley Abberley Valley to to study machine made lace which again is a study all of its own because there's so, there's so many different types and so many different types of machine but yes Nottingham Lace 
as far as bobbin lice and handmade lice went, nearly wiped it out because yeah. it was so expensive to hand make lace and you could buy machine made the, the working the working cap classes could buy lace to 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 put on their costumes not as elaborate as some of them but they could put lace on on their underskirts and they could put lace on their underwear and they could afford it so yes nottingham was um Again, Queen Victoria was instrumental in saving, going towards helping to save the handmade lace industry. She would commission pieces and her ladies in waiting would commission pieces of bobbin lace to make sure it didn't die out as a craft. So Victoria was very, the, the, the Victorians at Albert and Victoria were fantastic in, in trying to keep old crafts going. I hope that's answered it not too fully. No, no, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, and just uh, on a, a nice question to end on, and Wendy's asked, did you meet your lace jumper? Yes, I did. It was very good. Well, um, I, I, like, I like, I started lace knitting first, a long, long time ago. I knitted a lot of Aaron. Then in 1994, I started, I was, Asked to join, because I was a craft person, I was always sitting knitting or doing cross stitch in the staff room at a college where I worked. And they said, um, would you like to come and try a lace class? And I thought, ooh, that sounds interesting. And from then on, I've been hooked. So I keep, I jump from, at the moment during lockdown, for some unknown reason, I've gone back to um, knitting and I'm knitting for my grandson. So uh, I've done a lot of these, I've got wool, well, it's not wool, they're all cottons because I can't make me wool because it makes me itch. They're all cottons and I've been experimenting. I found odd balls and I've been combining them and making patterns and making it up as I go along. Sort of really, can you pan it down a bit? <laughs> I've been really, really playing. <laughs> so I've been enjoying myself, but I've got to get back to my lace because I've got to make a competition piece. I need to enter the competition for 2022. And so I've got to get back to some lace making, but I like modern lace, I like color. That's why I'm enthralled by Anne. Um, I'm not the fine and white sort. I don't think I've made any fine and white in my life. I'm trying to think, no, oh, I, I did. I made a, a garter. That was quite <laughs> funny, really. <laughs> I made a garter when I first started making lace. And um, I met my partner around about the same time as I started this new job and started making lace. And we've been engaged for 20... 20 something years. 20, 20, 27 years, I think it is. And um, 24, 24, well, whatever. 25 this year. 25, there you are. 25 years this year. And my, gar my garter is in a little box, which I, I, I give talks. We go around giving talks and I'll talk about my lace guild experience and my lace experience. And um, I get this garter out and it's yellow. And I said, it's like um, Miss Havisham's garter. And everybody laughs because I don't think I'll ever get married. Might be like Ken Dodd. He might ask me to marry him two days before he dies. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm not bothered. <laughs> yes, so I've, that's about the only final white I've ever done. I like right. doing modern pieces, contemporary lace. Like, but this is this is contemporary. This is combining techniques and using lots of different threads and colours. Beautiful. I keep showing that. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you ever so much for your time, Denise. It's been really, really interesting. And thank Pleasure. you everyone for attending as well. Um, we have got a host of events happening across Wolverhampton History Week. Um, and you can see those at wolverhamptonart.org.uk. Um, so, yeah, thank you everyone for attending. And I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. I'm just glad I could keep going. <laughs> Indeed, thank you ever so much. Thank you.